First, we'll learn the difference between ionic and covalent bonds. And then we're going to talk all about ionic bonds and how they form, then covalent bonds and how they form. We learned in a previous lesson that atoms want to obey the octet rule. The octet rule states that atoms want to have a full valence shell of electrons. That is the outermost energy level. The first energy level can hold two electrons. And then each energy level after that can hold eight electrons. Atoms work to follow the octet rule by participating in chemical reactions to create chemical compounds. Atoms bond with other atoms to form compounds. During a chemical reaction, the valence electrons will be lost, gained, or shared by atoms. There are two types of bonds that will form between atoms, ionic bonds and covalent bonds. When ionic bonds form, one element will lose valence electrons and the other element will gain valence electrons. In general, ionic bonds form between metals and nonmetals. When a covalent bond forms, two elements will share valence electrons. And in general, covalent bonds will form between two nonmetals. In general, elements on the left side of the periodic table will lose valence electrons to form positively charged ions, and elements on the right side of the periodic table will gain electrons to form negatively charged ions. The magnitude of the charge will be equal to the number of electrons that were lost or gained. There is a quick and easy way to determine the number of valence electrons. The number of valence electrons will be equal to the group number that the element is in. So everything in group 1 has one valence electron. Everything in group 2 has two valence electrons. We skip these center elements because they don't follow this trend. Then this is group 3 over here, and group 3 will have three valence electrons, and then we keep on counting from there. So everything in this last group, group 8, has eight valence electrons. They have already satisfied the octet rule because their valence shell is already full. So they don't really react to form compounds. So groups 1, 2, and 3 will lose all of their valence electrons. These are metals. In general, metals will lose valence electrons. Since they are losing electrons, and electrons are negatively charged, they will end up having a positive charge. The magnitude of the charge is equal to the number of electrons lost. So group 1 will have a plus 1 charge, group 2 will have a plus 2 charge, and group 3 will have a 3 plus charge. Groups 5, 6, and 7 will gain valence electrons so that they have 8. These are the nonmetals. So in general, nonmetals will gain valence electrons. Since they are gaining electrons and electrons are negatively charged, they will have an overall negative charge. The magnitude of the charge is equal to the number of electrons the atom gained. Everything in group 5 will gain 3 valence electrons. So everything in group 5 will have a 3 minus charge. In group 6, they will gain 2 electrons, and so they will have a 2 minus charge. And group 7 will gain 1 electron, so they will have a minus 1 charge. When a positive ion meets a negative ion, they stick together because opposite charges attract. The attraction is called electrostatic force. An ionic compound, then, is composed of negatively charged and positively charged particles sticking together. Although the individual particles have charges, the ionic compound is electrically neutral. That is, the compound does not have an overall charge. The reason is because the total number of positive charges will cancel the total number of negative charges. Let's see how this works. Sodium forms a cation with a plus one charge, and chlorine forms an anion with a minus one charge. When these two ions meet, they naturally balance each other out, since their charges are the same magnitude. So one sodium and one chloride ion will stick together to form the compound NaCl, sodium chloride. Magnesium forms a cation with a 2 plus charge, and chlorine forms an anion with a negative 1 charge. When these two ions meet, they do not naturally balance each other out. So another chloride ion will come in to give an overall negative charge of 2 minus. I just added the charges of the two chloride ions. So one magnesium and two chlorides will stick together to form the compound MgCl2, magnesium chloride. Here's a tough one, aluminum and oxygen. Aluminum has a 3 plus charge, and oxide has a 2 minus charge. How will these balance? Well, the lowest common multiple of 3 and 2 is 6. So if I had two aluminum ions, I would have a total of 6 plus. And if I had three oxide ions, I would have a total of 6 minus. So two aluminums and three oxides will stick together to form the compound Al2O3, aluminum oxide. Ions are not always monatomic, that is, made up of a single atom. Sometimes multiple atoms are stuck together already, and the resulting group of atoms has an overall positive or negative charge. Here's an example. Phosphate is a polyatomic ion. It's an ion that is composed of multiple atoms. Phosphate has the formula PO4 with a 3 minus charge. 
the entire group of atoms has a three minus charge. Just like a single nitrogen atom has a three minus charge, the entire phosphate ion has a three minus charge. Let's compare the compounds formed when magnesium reacts with the nitrite ion and when magnesium reacts with the phosphate ion. Magnesium has a two plus charge and nitride has a three minus charge. So we would need three magnesiums and two nitrides to make the charges balance. The formula would be Mg3N2. Magnesium has a two plus charge and phosphate has a three minus charge. So we would need three magnesiums and two phosphate ions to get the charges to balance. How would I write this? If I wrote it like this, Mg3PO4 with the subscript two, it would say that there's 42 oxygens. But what I really wanna say is that there are two phosphate ions. So I will put the PO4 into brackets like this and put the two on the outside. This tells me that there's two of everything inside the brackets. And so this is the formula for magnesium phosphate. Remember that elements on the right side of the periodic table tend to gain electrons. What if two elements that wanted to gain electrons came together to form a chemical bond? They can't both steal electrons from one another. Instead, they will end up sharing their valence electrons. A covalent bond is formed when atoms share valence electrons. And when a covalent bond forms, a molecule is created. Determining the chemical formula of a substance containing covalent bonds is different from the chemical formula of a substance containing ionic bonds. With ionic compounds, we determine the charges on the ions and then balance the positive and negative charges. With covalent compounds, the atoms will not form ions and so there will not be any charges. Instead, we're going to pair up unpaired valence electrons. Electrons want to be paired with another electron. They like to be in groups of two. There are two ways that electrons can be paired. They can be paired in a covalent bond or as a lone pair around the atom. So let's see how to determine the chemical formula of a covalently bonded compound. Remember that these compounds will contain elements that are non-metals. So what is the chemical formula between carbon and fluorine? Here are the steps to determining the formula. That is the number of each atom in the compound. First, draw an electron dot structure, also known as a Lewis structure, of each element. Next, pair up unpaired electrons. Add more atoms, if required, to give each element a complete octet. And then finally, you can write the formula. So the electron dot structure shows the number of valence electrons. We draw them symmetrically so that each side of the symbol contains at most two electrons. Carbon has four electrons, and I've spaced them out equally. Notice that these electrons are not paired up. Fluorine has seven electrons, and only one electron will be unpaired. This means that that electron will want to participate in a chemical bond so that's paired up with another electron. So we can pair this electron up with one of the electrons of carbon. Now fluorine has eight electrons because it's sharing an electron with carbon. Carbon now has five electrons. Now we can move to step three and add more atoms if required. We're gonna add three more fluorines so that they can bond to carbon's remaining three unpaired electrons. This gives carbon a full valence shell of eight and each fluorine a full valence shell of eight. I'm gonna redraw this as a structural formula or a Lewis structure by drawing the circled electrons as a single line, a covalent bond. And now I can write the formula. The formula indicates the number of each element, so it's CF4. Let's try another one, hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is special because it only wants two valence electrons, not eight. Oxygen has two electrons that are unpaired, and so two hydrogens will bond with the oxygen to make a compound, it's H2O. Let's try another one, carbon and oxygen. In this case, we're gonna have a special situation where a double bond will form between the carbon and each oxygen. Each oxygen has two unpaired electrons, and so those two unpaired electrons will pair up with two electrons from the carbon atom to create double bonds on either side of the carbon atom. Let's try another one, nitrogen bonding with another nitrogen atom. In this case, we'll have another special situation where a triple bond will form between the two nitrogens. Since each nitrogen has three unpaired electrons, those three unpaired electrons will pair up to create a triple bond. And here's another example. What about carbon bonding with just one other oxygen? When we pair up all the unpaired electrons, oxygen fills its valence shell before carbon does. 
there isn't anything else that oxygen wants from the carbon. But carbon isn't satisfied. It only has six valence electrons right now. We need to get both atoms to obey the octet rule. Oxygen realizes that carbon is short by two electrons, so it shares two of its own valence electrons that are in a lone pair to create a bond with the oxygen. This is called a coordinate covalent bond. Coordinate covalent bond is when one element shares two of its own electrons to create a bond with another element. And one last example. Ozone has a chemical formula O3. Here's what the structural formula looks like. Now this is only one way to draw the structural formula, but there is another way. We could draw it like this. It looks like just the same molecule just flipped around. But in fact, these are different structural formulas. I didn't move the oxygen atoms. They're still in the same location. I just moved the bonds. So these two structures are completely equal and completely possible. This is called resonance. Resonance is when there are more than one way to represent a Lewis structure of a chemical compound without moving the atoms around. Both are possible, and so both will exist in nature.